Isaiah chapter 56. Of course, that means we passed 55 last week, which is a real high point in the book of Isaiah, as I'm sure you've seen. Uh, chapter 55 is hard to get away from. It speaks of the glories of the everlasting salvation and also of his greatness and power. Uh, one of my favorite verses, I told you was a go-to verse with a lot of people with a lot of questions, is his ways are higher than the heavens. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Uh, and we talked about the blessing and the power of the word of God that comes down like rain from heaven to water the earth and to cause there to be, uh, you know, uh, seed for the sower, bread for the eater. Uh, so is my word, the Lord declares. It won't return void, but it'll accomplish that which I please, and it'll prosper in the things for which I sent it. Amen. Now, chapter 55 is such a climatic chapter that there are certain scholars who would say, why doesn't the book end here? And if you're one of those, you remember in the very beginning we talked about the single Isaiah and the double Isaiahs and the triple Isaiah. If you're a double or triple Isaiah, well, then that's not a problem. It's just like, well, it did end there, but somebody else wrote some more chapters. But if you uh, believe, like I do, that there was only one Isaiah, and I believe that because Jesus referred to both the latter part of the book and the earlier part of the book and said there was only one Isaiah. If there's only one Isaiah, then that literally means that something needs to be added, that he wasn't finished. That was a real high point, a real climax, but there's something else that needs to go on. And the things that go on from chapter 56 through 66, where we're starting in tonight, emphasizes righteousness. He wants to remind us of that right standing with him. And he's talking about, again, something that's very convicting. It's people's inability to live righteously. We seem to fall. We seem to give in to temptation. We seem to do things we shouldn't be doing and not doing things we should be doing. Even the Apostle Paul said that. I, I find myself doing things I don't want to do. And I don't want to do things I find myself doing. So we've got to be very careful with that. But it's people's inability to live righteously and it goes on to show us um, the main theme probably of this church is grace oh, yeah. showing us the lord's grace showing people how to move from the letter of the law into the spirit and uh, living holy lives now as we get into chapter 56 this is a pivotal chapter in the book of isaiah the lord is giving us more or less some conditions that need to be met to be able to be a part of the everlasting kingdom and salvation. And God delivers a beautiful message about the scope of his salvation. Do you remember the Jews for a long time and even certain factions of the Jews today believe that God is their God and nobody else. And if you're a Gentile and some believe Gentiles are just dirty dogs, why would God have anything to do with you? And God is very clearly tonight stating you know what, you put restrictions, you use my word to make those restrictions, but I want you to know that something's gonna change, something new is coming, and I'm gonna do something magnificent uh, that is a part of the everlasting kingdom and salvation. So we'll read of God's love and acceptance that extends beyond the boundaries of race and nationality or physical conditions reaching out to those who live righteously and commit themselves to him. In other words, believe and obey. The doors are open for you. People try to divide on so many of these issues. You know, you're this, so you can't be, or uh, you've done this, so you can't be uh, doing this or that or the other thing. And the Lord says, you know what? I love you. I forgive you. I take you in. I will use you. And honestly, I'm surprised at times that God would ever use me. And I'm surprised at some of the people I know and the places they've been and things they've done. It's like, wow, if God can use him, I guess he can use anybody. And that's true of me too. So uh, this chapter kind of divides up like this. Verses one and two is a call to righteousness. By the way, this is a very short chapter again. There's only 12 verses in it. Uh, a small chapter, but it's huge in information and the things that he's trying to convey to us. So. Uh, one and two, a call to righteousness. The chapter opens with God's command to maintain justice and do what's right. And it's by his righteousness that my life uh, is the basis of acceptance and blessing from him. 
because of his righteousness. He died to make us righteous, the righteousness of Christ. So there's a lot of controversy uh, over the next part of that verse because he's going to talk about the one who does not profane the Sabbath. I want you to keep that specific word in mind, profane the Sabbath. I'm not saying the one who doesn't keep the Sabbath. That's included in what we're going to discuss. We're going to try to handle a lot about the Sabbath tonight, so that takes up a major portion of what we're going to look at tonight. A lot of controversy, and we'll try to cover it as fully as we can. Then verses 3 through 8 is about not discriminating against foreigners, people who are not of the Jewish race, people who live outside the land, and outcasts. Who are the outcasts? We're going to look at several of them. There's a lot of outcast people who aren't allowed into places because of who they are and what they stand for. God is saying, I don't want my people to discriminate against other people who would try to join themselves to me. Oh, really? We even saw this among the apostles, didn't we? Get those kids out of here. Hey, hey you guys get out of here. Let the children <laughs> come unto me. That's I don't right. want anything to come between me and somebody who wants to know me. Somebody wants to get to know me. But the apostles were literally discriminating against children, right? We can't have children here. And the Lord is saying, oh, yes, we can. Such is the kingdom of heaven. So God extends his blessing to the foreigners. And he's going to mention eunuchs in here. Uh, those that would follow him, those that would choose to follow his ways. He says, I'm going to give you a place in my house. And you remember the tabernacle and temple were places that... Uh, people who had physical disabilities or maladies weren't allowed to go. Foreigners weren't allowed to go. And the Lord's saying, this is going to be open and everybody's going to be welcome. This is out of the book of Isaiah. This is a long time ago. And he's giving the gospel, the good news. That Christ will accept anyone who receives him and chooses to walk with him. So it speaks to the inclusive nature of God. And I really like that because I hear so much of this inclusive talk today. You hear it all on the, you know, the YouTube and the news channels and whatever else it is, uh, Snapchat or Instagram or whatever. I don't know. I don't follow most of those, but they're all talking about equality. They're all talking about um, discrimination and they're all talking about uh, being included and inclusive. I don't think we have to include weird things that aren't biblical or aren't normal, right. but God is inclusive of all people. He loves them and he wants to work in their lives and he wants to make changes where necessary. And that's what he's been doing in each and every one of us. Thank so you, his inclusive nature and those who were formerly considered outside can also receive his blessings. That's what he wants to give. That is really good news to some people because they've been told or taught that God cannot accept you. You're this or you've done that. But God is inclusive. Then verses 9 through 12, he's going to condemn the unfaithful leaders. The final verse uh, is an intense critique against the unfaithful leaders of the, of the uh, people. He says, you're, you're like blind watchmen, uh, a watchman who can't see, what good is he? He said, you're like dogs that can't bark. If you've got a dog that's your watchdog, you expect him to bark, don't you? And if he doesn't, you wonder what's wrong with your dog. So he's saying, you're dogs that don't bark. I'm kind of wondering if he's like friendly dogs. I'm, I'm not going to bark. I know the neighbors complain. So um, I see this guy coming in the backyard, but I just won't bark tonight. I'm sure I'll make everybody happy and everybody will love me. I'll be the best doggy in the neighborhood. <laughs> Until they find out who you let in, you know. So uh, these leaders are described as selfish, lacking understanding, and focusing on their own gains. Does that sound familiar at all? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're selfish, lacking understanding, and focusing on their own gain. So this is a portion of scripture that's relevant to our world today, very relevant to our world today. God does not want corrupt leadership. And this is a, a part of what has brought rejection and cursing on the people of Israel and the cursing of mankind. So let's begin with verse 1. It says, Thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. 
Every, even at the time of Isaiah, there were encouragements to do the right thing in the light of the Lord soon coming. The Lord goes, I'm preparing things. I'm making things ready. I'm going to come. And this was the case in Isaiah. It wasn't that long before the Messiah appeared on the earth. It wasn't the Messiah a lot of people were expecting. It wasn't who they were looking for. But surprise, it's the one who fit the description in Isaiah and the other prophetic books too. But throughout all succeeding generations, God wanted each generation to live with that consciousness of the nearness of the coming of the Lord's kingdom. Now, Peter tells us that there would come a day when men would begin to scoff and the nearness of the kingdom of God uh, isn't gonna happen according to them. They declare that all things have continued uh, as they were from the beginning. If you've taken any science classes, this is called the principle of uniformitarianism. Everything just stays the same. The rocks are the same, the trees are the same. Nothing's changed, everything's the same. Uh, the Messiah hasn't come, so he's never coming. Oh, but he already came. Well, we don't believe that, so there's not another one coming. You know, They just don't believe because they're into this particular principle. Peter said they're willfully ignorant to the fact that God did upset the world at one time by sending judgment through a flood, and they were willingly ignorant of God's intervention by catastrophe. Do you think he got people's attention? Yeah, he did. And he promised at the end, I'm not going to do it this way again. That just leaves us some other options, you know, like <laughs> fire or <laughs> famine or something else like that. But... He's not going to fail in that promise. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So the reason for the delay is that God is waiting for man to turn to him. The span of man on this earth is so short, yet think about this, in this short span, and we've talked about this several times, I mean, 60 or 70 or 80 seems like a long time if you're 13. <laughs> but once you get up towards those that edge of life is like, wow, that wasn't very long. That went by so quickly. Yeah, true. And maybe you discovered too, like I have, that it just keeps going faster and faster and faster. Weren't we here like an hour ago or right. last night or something? You know. But during this short span, there's something going on. Here's what's going on. Uh, my eternity is being established. That's what we're here for, to determine our eternity. It's not just to live and die and have that little space in between. Where are you going? What are you doing? My destiny is being determined. And it's an awesome thing to consider that and meditate on that. Where is the Lord taking me? What have I done with what he's offered me? What is it that I've gathered together that I can't take with me and is going to be useless in eternity? And what is it that I put my stock and faith and time and talent and treasure into that's going to make a difference in eternity? I want to hear, well done, good and faithful Me servant. Too. Amen. I don't want to hear, well, yeah, made it by the skin of your teeth. <laughs> Wouldn't that be horrible? Yes. I want to make an abundant entrance. So, uh, time is short. Now, Isaiah is saying the time of the Lord is close, and it is for each one of us. It may not be hundreds of years if you're looking at time historically. We're not looking at the timeline of the world or the timeline of mankind. We're looking at our own timeline. It's short. And what happens after that? We have an appointment. We have a meeting. We're going to face the Lord. We're going to meet the Lord personally. And so we should live with that consciousness, knowing that I only have one life. You remember the old saying, "Twill soon be past. Only what's done for Jesus will last. Yes. And that's true. Everything else is wood, hay, and stubble. Everything else is going to burn. And it's not going to have any value in the eternal realm. We kind of joke about that sometimes, you know. Something breaks out and you go, oh, well, it's going to burn. <laughs> the thing is, it's true. It's completely the truth. That which I have done for myself, that which I've done for community, that which I've done for whatever, is going to last. The only thing that lasts is that which I've done for the Lord, for his glory and his name. So time is short. And this is a perpetual message to each generation. You may be younger, but your time is short. Some of us may be older, so we're a little shorter on time, at least time here, but we get to spend eternity with the Lord. 
So how does God want us to live? Well, he says, keep justice and do righteousness. Keep justice. Do things that are just, that are honest, that are right. And righteousness is right standing with God. So the prophet begins this by announcing these are God's words. Thus saith the Lord. Okay, this means it's non-negotiable. This means this is what he wants. And if people are wise, they'll listen and do more than just listen. They'll become doers of the word of God. God says do this. That's something I need to consider. It's something I need to do. <clears throat> God wants us to live fair and honest life. He doesn't want us cheating. He doesn't want us conniving. He doesn't want us taking advantage of someone else. <clears throat> Excuse me. God wants us to do the right thing, to do justice and righteousness, to be in right standing with God. What God is asking of us really is not too much for reasonable people. I mean, don't you want people to be nice to you and just with you and fair with you? I do. I, I want everyone to be treated honestly and wouldn't it be wonderful if our whole world was that way if everybody was honest and fair this could be a, a fairly nice place why isn't it because men's hearts are deceitful and wicked above all things and they don't do fair and honest thing that's the condition of the world we will always seem to find men who are willing to take advantage of their position and they will gouge someone else because they find that they have them at some disadvantage. That's right. People want to be able to use an advantage over other people. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel powerful, right? But is that what you should be doing? So it's, it's always a fearsome thing to be at a disadvantage of another person because you can be sure they're going to take every advantage they can. So look what's being done. One example with oil. One nation has so much oil, they don't know what to do. They make more money and more money and more money, and they buy 20 cars and build big palaces and everything else, and yet there's a world out there with people that are starving to death mm -hmm. and hungry, and, and these people can't even spend all the money they've got. They've got so much. And so the third world is being destroyed and starved because those who've taken advantage of the fact that they possess the oil and the world is short on oil. So they gouge the world, disregarding the unfortunate people who can't afford the inflation and uh, that has resulted from increased oil prices. That's just one example. I don't want to uh, just point at one group. It's common with human nature. It is. If you get into a disadvantaged position, there are men who are willing to take advantage of you. Jesus said it this way, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Why? They were taking advantage of the people. Huh. Taking advantage of widows. Getting rich off other people's problems. Man is generally not fair. And God wants us to be fair. My kids all the time are going, that's not fair. And I've, I've had to resort to telling them, trying to teach them some. I said, the only fair thing you're going to find is if we go down to the L.A. County Fair once a That's year. Right. Outside of that, nothing's fair. And even there, there's people who want to take advantage of you. You know, I got this mop to sell you. It's like no other mop you've ever seen. We've all been there, haven't we? <coughs> so, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness is to be revealed. The emphasis here is not on maintaining justice and doing righteousness so that salvation and deliverance will come. If we're good enough, if we do the right things, then salvation will come. It's, it's just the opposite. God is saying salvation and deliverance are just around the corner. They're very close. And uh, you need to practice righteousness and justice so that you'll be ready to receive salvation when it comes. Don't, don't wait to plan for the future. Plan for the future now. The emphasis, again, not maintaining justice because of deliverance might come, but because you need to be ready to receive. In the New Testament, John the Baptist issues a similar call. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then we see that Jesus echoes that call too. So verse 2, blessed is the man who does this. God's pronouncing a blessing 
on the man who will be fair and honest, you're going to get blessed from God. You want a blessing? Just be fair and honest. God knows, God sees, God hears, and God will bless you. And the son of man who lays hold on it, the person who grasps this concept and decides, I want to do to people what I want them to do to me. Exactly. I want to do to others what I want others to do to me, to treat them like I want them to treat me. I'll be fair. I won't take advantage of others because of my position or any authority I might have. And, and you have to realize, too, God is always for the underdog. God is always standing up for the oppressed and the poor. And if we're guilty of oppressing impoverished people, you will find yourself in opposition to God and his word. You will. So he goes on in verse 2 and he says, Who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hands from doing any evil. Well, that's pretty hard to do, the doing any evil. That's got to be the help of the Holy Spirit in my life. But uh, something interesting about the Sabbath, there's a lot of controversy over these things. Did you know Israel was the very first nation in the world that was given a day off? Wow. Everybody else worked every day, all week, all month. <laughs> We're not even sure when they got all the weeks and months and the seven days in a week thing worked out. Uh, it's being attributed to Babylonians. <coughs> uh, but there's older calendars. A lot of them we don't know how they work or what they stand for. But we know that Israel was told to take the seventh day off. God rested after creation. You can too. And then he makes it a part of the Decalogue too. Uh, uh, the fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. 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 Separate. Different from everything else. Different from the other the day. So uh, <clears throat> no other people had the concept of taking a day off in seven to rest. And God is saying, I want you to rest. They kept ignoring it. What's been one of the major problems? They're violating Sabbath. They've polluted it, and we often do too. Now, I'm going to explain some things here. It's not that I'm uh, ignoring the Saturday Sabbath and polluting that. It's a rest, and I don't always take the rest. I'm too busy. I got stuff to do. And if Saturday's my only day off, I really got a lot of stuff to do to catch up for the rest of the week, right? The blessing is on the man who keeps from defiling the Sabbath. The Sabbath was an ordinance that was given to uh, the Jewish people established with the nation of Israel as a covenant with that family of people. It was an ordinance. And when God gave the law of the Sabbath back in the book of Exodus, he declared that the giving of the law was a specific covenant between him and Israel forever. Okay? Exodus 31, we read, Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. When does that end? When, do they, when can they stop? Yeah, they can't. It's, it's a perpetual covenant. It's, it's a covenant. sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Right. For in six days, Jehovah made the earth and on the seventh he rested and was refreshed. So God established Hallelujah. circumcision as a perpetual covenant with the Jewish people. The Sabbath covenant was not placed on the Gentile world or the Gentile church or individual Christians, okay? Technically, the Jews celebrate Sabbath from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. But the serious people, the ultra-Orthodox, take it seriously and you don't do anything. You, uh, they, they make excuses and they've got a whole bunch of things in the Talmud and the Mishnah. Uh, one of the funniest ones is there's this line. It's, it's like a telephone line. It goes around the entire city of Jerusalem. And it's got a name. They call it IAL. And uh, to them, this is the confines of your home. Now, on Sabbath, you're not supposed to walk past two-thirds of a mile. But if I'm in the confines of my home, I can pick up a burden, which I'm not supposed to do, and I can walk clear across town. Why? I'm inside the line. A few years back, there was a heavy, heavy snowstorm there, and the line broke. Freaked out all the Orthodox people. Like, I'm not at home anymore. What am I going to do? Goodness. So it's crazy, but uh, in a long running controversy. So, should Christians worship the Lord on Sabbath day or Saturday? The answer to this controversial question is 
Absolutely, yes. Right. I, I should worship the Lord on Saturday and Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, every day of the week. <laughs> I'm persuaded that Christians should worship not only on Saturday, but every day. Well, why then do some say that our assembling together should be only on Saturday and that those churches who assemble on Sunday violate God's word? I don't know. I haven't seen in God's word anywhere where it says if you meet on Sunday or if you meet on the first day of the week, you're in violation of God's word. I haven't found that anywhere. If you do, please let me know. <laughs> It'd be real interesting. The argument they give in keeping the Sabbath day is they're keeping the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And uh, so the question is, are we violating the commandment because we worship on Sunday? Some have even gone so far as to say that we're taking the mark of the beast oh. by worshiping on the first day of the week. So let's look at this issue in light of the word of God. Again, Sabbath day was given primarily as a picture of our life in Jesus Christ. Come unto me, all you labor and are laden. I will give you rest. That's what Sabbath means. Rest or comfort. I want to give you rest. In Jesus, I have rest. Jesus is my Sabbath. I don't have a Sabbath day necessarily. I have a Sabbath life. I am not working for my salvation anymore. Right. I don't have to. It's been given to me by the blood of Jesus Christ. So Sabbath cessation or rest under the old covenant was to be a day of physical relaxation and spiritual restoration. Yeah. Now Jesus says we can have a relaxation from our labors for salvation. I don't have to work for it. Ephesians 2, For by grace you're saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. So as believers, we don't have, again, a Sabbath day. We have a Sabbath life. Uh, we read in Hebrews 4, Therefore there remains a rest, literally a keeping of Sabbath, for the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. So did Jesus keep the Sabbath? I mean, we always look to him as an example. Jesus was the one who fulfilled the laws and ordinances perfectly. Had he failed to do so, he would have not been the perfect sacrificial lamb to die in our place. He is our Sabbath rest. The work is finished and complete. And yet in Mark chapter 2, we see his disciples picking corn on the Sabbath day. Do you remember that one? <laughs> Walking through the fields, they're hungry. Somebody forgot to tell them it was Saturday. <laughs> they start picking the produce and eating it. And of course, there was always those Pharisees following along who wanted to point out any error that they made. And they called them on it. They said, why are your, why are your disciples eating on the Sabbath day? And Jesus, when questioned about this, clarified the value of the Sabbath day. He said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God's intent was that a day would be set aside for physical relaxation and spiritual renewal, not for man's bondage. I didn't give you this day so that you would be in bondage. So you'd be all like, oh, I broke Sabbath. I, I picked something heavy up, or I walked past two-thirds of a mile, or I lit a fire. Oh. Hmm. Still a practical principle for all of us. Next, did the early church keep Sabbath? The overwhelming biblical evidence is that the early church met on what they would call the Lord's Day. Revelation 1.10, which was the first day of the week. We would call it Sunday by our calendar with the weird names that came from the Latin and the Romans. Uh, you can also see Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. This day was chosen because it was the day that our Lord rose from the dead. So let's look at the contrast between the Jewish Sabbath and the Christian's Lord's Day. Now, I don't have a problem with either one of these. I think Jews need to do that, but I don't think you can force me to do it. And I don't think anybody should force you to do it either. Number one, the Jewish Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath is called Sabbath. It's the Jewish Sabbath day. We call it the Lord's day because that's what the scripture calls it. Uh, theirs is the seventh day of the week. Ours is the first day of the week. Theirs commemorates God's creation rest on the seventh day. 
Our day commemorates Christ's resurrection from the dead on the first day. Theirs commemorates a finished creation. Ours commemorates a finished redemption. Theirs is compulsory and obedience is demanded. And ours is voluntary and worship is expected. Exodus 35, 2. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day shall be to you a holy day, a Sabbath rest to the Lord. Whoever does work in there shall be put to death. Christ went about doing good things on Sabbath, didn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah. Matthew 12, 1 through 8. Ours, uh, theirs represents the old creation. Ours represents a new creation. Theirs was given to Israel under the law. Our rest was given to Christians under grace. Under grace. Mm -hmm. So does anyone really keep Sabbath? I, I think this is an interesting question because first of all, our calendar, the particular calendar we use is only accurate back to the third century, all right? Before that, we're not sure whose calendar was accurate or what calendar was right. Mm -hmm. We really have no idea what Sabbath day is or was. Our Seventh-day Adventist friends failed to take in the uh, consideration of the longest day in Joshua. That would certainly mess up your calendar if anything else would. And uh, secondly, those who try to keep Sabbath day must keep it according to God's law. In other words, you better look up all the laws on Sabbath and keep them. If you're going to try to keep it, you have to be doing the whole law. So that means they can't kindle a fire on Sabbath day. Exodus 35, 2 and 3. So if you drive your car to a Sabbath meeting and you happen to have an internal combustion engine or an electric car where sparks are going off, you have made a, a fire. You've made a combustion. You violated the Sabbath. That's what I'm trying to say. So do they heat their churches on Sabbath day? Do they light their churches or do they just sit in the dark and either bake or freeze depending upon the weather that we have here? Uh, they're actually uh, kindling a fire if they light it or heat it and are violating the Sabbath rules they're trying to keep. And again, two-thirds of a mile, carry a bird, cooking food, you don't do it. So they've made up all these fun things. Uh, there's many Orthodox Jews who have automatic locks on their doors so that at a certain time it'll unlock so that they can go out the door It'll lock so that they can go to Shabbat service, which is in two-thirds of a mile. Actually, actually, within one-third of a mile because they've only got another third to get back home afterwards, right? <laughs> but they know at a certain time it's going to unlock again. They can go in the door, then the door will relock, and you can have dinner. Well, how do you have dinner? You can't cook anything. You have this big metal plate that you put on the burners, and the pilot light will keep it hot. So you cook everything the day before and you put it on the metal thing and it'll keep your food warm for you so that you can eat, but you don't have uh, lots of little things that you do to try and, and keep up with all of this kind of stuff. <laughs> According to the law, the penalty for such violation is death. Thanks be to God, we're free from the curse of the law, Galatians 3.13. So then, is it wrong to worship on Saturday? No. No, of course not. We're free to worship on any day. We're free to worship on every day. But Scripture strongly exhorts us not to be hung up on which day to worship. That's what drives me crazy, is people that are always trying to convince me that I have to do something. I don't want to be drawn back under the bondage of legalism. Mm -hmm. Galatians says, you observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I've bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul is saying, did I waste my time? If you're still going to try and keep the law? So where can I find a simple summary statement concerning this controversy? It's Colossians. Um, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. These were foreshadowing, foretelling what Christ would do. Christ is the substance. He's the one who gave me rest. So remember, we don't have a Sabbath day, but again, we have a Sabbath life in Christ. It's a shadow of Jesus. Christ is the substance. Uh, 
Yet, I do believe that a man, a woman, needs a day of rest. God intended this to be a day of recuperation. It is. You get worn out during the week, right? <laughs> yes. I do anyway. So how many of us, and I'm, don't ask, I'm not asking for hands, but how many of us actually take a real rest day? That's what the uh, requirement really was, to give the body a chance to recuperate. A very good thing to do. Pick a day and rest. But they began to make it a day of pleasure and recreation. I remember a couple of my Adventist friends, what are you doing this Sabbath? Oh, we're renting a plane and flying up to Big Bear so we can go skiing. I'm like, wow, how many laws can you break in one setting? <laughs> <laughs> but it's something we're guilty of too. The book of Acts, the early church sought to determine what relationship the Gentile believers had to the law. And they decided that they should not put on the Gentiles the yoke of bondage, the law which they themselves couldn't keep. So in writing to the Gentile churches to tell them of their relationship to the law, they wrote, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you would abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, mm -hmm. from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you do well. See you later. That's the modern farewell. Later on, Paul modified this a little bit, and he wrote to the Corinthians, don't ask the butcher if the meat was offered to idols. That's right. Okay? If he says yes, you may have a hard time eating it for consciousness sake. He said everything is sanctified through prayer. It really doesn't matter. Unless your conscience begins to give you trouble, then it's a personal problem. So for consciousness sake, don't ask. All right? I learned that quickly in the Philippines. I did not want to know where the food came from. Oh. <laughs> Jesus taught us, it's not which goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. So the heart is uh, revealed by the things that come out of man's mouth, right? You know where their heart is. So there was uh, nothing said to the Gentile church concerning Sabbath days. So Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, speaks about those who are weak in faith. And he said, receive one who's weak in faith. Don't dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. He becomes a vegetarian. They were afraid they might eat something offered to idols. So uh, they became vegetarians. Then he, Paul goes on to say, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. So, because I want to be fair and I want to be nice, I don't offer my Jewish friends a ham and cheese sandwich, okay? <laughs> now, I've been to a burger place there where they've invented fake cheese. And, and I was sitting there and I had talked with the waiter and the waitress and said, you guys are Orthodox, right? And they go, yep. And I go, okay. So this is a kosher restaurant. They go, yep. And then I see this cheeseburger go by and I go, hey, what's this? They go, oh, it's not real cheese. It's fake. <laughs> and they said, look at this. On the menu, they had a thing called fake it. <laughs> it has pretend bacon. So they, again, worked it around so that you can get a fake bacon cheeseburger <laughs> in a kosher restaurant in Jerusalem. <clears throat> But what the Lord is saying here is don't judge each other or what they eat. So it's, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking everybody should eat what I eat. Everybody should think what I think. And everybody wants to run the world and tell everybody else how they should act. And uh, what is right and wrong according to their conscience. Paul said, I'm not going to judge the person who has greater liberty than I have. Who are you to judge another man's servants? Uh, to his own master he stands and falls. Indeed, he will... Be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Now, much to my amazement in writing the Colossians, Paul said, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect to a holy day or a new moon or a Sabbath day, for these are all a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So these things were all a shadow. The real substance is Christ. So the Sabbath day was a shadow of what Jesus is to us. He's our rest. Christ has become our Sabbath. We are resting in the work of Jesus. 
uh, especially regard to our salvation. I do not have to go out and hustle and work to be saved. I don't, I don't need notches in my Bible. I don't need to witness to a certain number of people. Yeah. I don't need to have so many converts and all. That's not what he's called me to do. He's called me to share, but we have to leave the results completely up to him. Hallelujah. So we're resting in him for our salvation. And that's the whole thing is about. So we read the Sabbath day. We realize Isaiah is addressing himself to Israel not necessarily the Gentile church. In the Gentile church, one man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. We esteem every day alike, every day is the Lord's day. When I wake up in the morning, I don't reach for my day time and go, oh, it's Friday, I can do stuff. <laughs> I don't have to. I wake up and I don't care what day it is. Lord, this is your day. What do you want me to do today? Every day is alike. And uh, my life is his, no matter what the calendar says. It's the Lord's day as far as I'm concerned. So, blessed is the man who does this, the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath. In other words, I could defile the Sabbath if I decided I wanted to keep the Sabbath or work, uh, not work on the Sabbath or do these things that I'm not required to do. I'd be like the foolish Galatians again. My Jewish friends... I congratulate them for keeping a Sabbath. I congratulate them if they want to keep a kosher kitchen. Great. That's a covenant for your nation, not for the Gentiles. So, uh, blessed is the man who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Be at rest, do what's right. Verse 3. Uh, do not let the son of a foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying... The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, here I am, a dry tree. Well, why would they say that? Why might they say that? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 23, we're told the foreigner, the non-Jew, could not come into the tabernacle or the temple. Or the eunuch, one who's been emasculated, can't come in either. And so when God speaks to the foreigners, he means Gentiles. Who Israel throughout the... I mean, I'm not going to negate the fact that the Gentile church has treated Israel horribly historically. But at the same time, Israel has treated the Gentiles as a lower form of life unworthy of Jehovah's concern. Mm -hmm. Right? So these verses extend God's promise to foreigners and eunuchs, two, group, two groups of people who have traditionally been treated as outcast. All right? Here he's saying there's a new day coming, some difference on the way. The Gentiles and the strangers are welcome in. Mm -hmm. You who have been unproductive, you come on in too. This is the good news. This is the gospel. We should not think that we're separated from the people of God. Paul has said, uh, Paul said Christ has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. The wall between the Jew and the Gentile. He's made us all partake of one body in Christ. So really we've been grafted in at the root. That we might partake of the fatness and fullness of God's blessing and promise to the nation of Israel. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord to my eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than the sons and daughters. Who are the sons and daughters? Those are Jews, right? And I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Hallelujah. In other words, salvation is for you, everyone. Choose me, I welcome you wholeheartedly. Jesus tells us there are some men and women who are born eunuchs. There are some who become eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. This is a man who may refrain from marriage in order they might better serve the Lord. We usually think of eunuchs in a very strict sense of the word, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the Bible looks at it as a man who's determined to live a celibate life for the sake of the kingdom. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, makes an interesting statement. He says, if you can handle this, if you can understand this, if you can grasp this, uh, I wish you could live like I do. I would that all men were even as myself. But every man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner, another after that. 
But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. And he follows up with, and he that's not can be fully occupied with the things of the Lord. I like the part in here where he says he has his proper gift of God. I believe that celibacy and marriage are both gifts from the Lord. And if you don't have one, you probably got the other, okay? It's a gift from God to be married. I mean, he wants you to have companionship and, and to procreate and uh, fill the world with fruit, right? But there's others that he's going to set aside and use specifically for his work. He that's unmarried can seek to please the Lord. Many times it's easier to endure hardships uh, by yourself. Sometimes sharing the gospel requires some hardships and sacrifice. And it's easier to make those sacrifices than impose them on spouse or family. It's not a sin either way. There are those who have chosen to serve the Lord that way. And he'll give them spiritual sons and daughters. Remember Paul speaks of Timothy as his beloved son in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Paul's relation with the younger men that he discipled in their walk with the Lord. So verse 6. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. In other words, don't mess with the rest. Uh, for us, rest is the finished word. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Wow, I like that. So who would he bring in? Sons and uh, daughters of strangers, the foreigners, to make my house a house of prayer. Now, the Jews in establishing the temple didn't really follow this. They had a court for Gentiles. Uh, and if you were a Gentile, you had to stay in that court. Outside of that court were signs that said, if you go any further, your life is in danger. We will kill you. So uh, it cost them. They had to stay up. Paul got in a big trouble, you remember, with the Jews because they thought he brought a circumcised man into the temple area, the Jewish area. And that's what created the riot in Jerusalem that almost resulted in Paul being killed. Paul was not guilty. They thought he was. And yet the Lord has declared, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. He's talking about the stranger, the person who's not a Jew, who follows the Lord. God wants them to feel that they have access through the temple. They were to pray for nations. That's the Jews. Pray for the Gentiles and encourage others to pray too. Oh, really? You remember when Jesus came into the temple, he saw those money changers that were there selling doves, and he made a whip and he began to overturn tables. And he began to drive them out, saying that they profaned the temple, and he quotes Isaiah. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, Amen. but you have made it a den of thieves. So the anger that Jesus had for profaning the temple, they wouldn't let Gentiles in, but we'll go ahead and run all kinds of crooked merchandising operations uh, that aren't legal either. Now the money changers, men in the booth in the temple, you couldn't pay your offering uh, in Roman currency. You had to exchange it for shekels and the exchange rate was high. Same was true with doves and lambs, exorbitant prices, and they were in business with the priest. So Jesus quotes here from Isaiah that God's intention was that house would be a house of prayer that would be open to anyone who wanted to pray and they'd be free to come in and pray in God's house. Verse 8, the Lord God who gathers the outcast of Israel says, yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. He's telling the Jews, mm -hmm. I'm bringing the rest of the world home. Amen. So this gospel will go out to the Gentiles again come seek and worship and we're going to stop here tonight because I hope we'd finish this whole chapter but a lot of stuff in here actually the next verse verse 9 begins a new section you remember first we spoke of the restoration of Israel the invitation to the Gentiles Isaiah goes on to speak of problems in the community corruption among Israel's rulers and then this is the denunciation of those who reject the invitation.
Those who refuse to be a part of this wonderful opportunity will be condemned here. So start with verse 9 for next time. Lord willing, that's where we're going to go. Would you stand with me? And let's close with a word of prayer.